and she's currently the Director of Nursing and Midwifery Education and Director of the Women and Newborn Research at Griffith University and the Gold Coast. And she's going to talk to us today about domestic violence. So handing over to Kathleen. Are you there, Kathleen? Yes, thank you, Hazel. I'm just unmuting my microphone. Uh, welcome to everybody. It gives me great pleasure today to present to you on um, such an international audience and play a part in the Virtual Day of the Midwife e-conference. So today I'd like to spend some time talking to you about <clears throat> the role of the midwife in supporting women to experience intimate partner violence during pregnancy. So the aim of uh, today's aim of today's presentation is to explore the social context of domestic violence, just to give people um, a bit of a background, discuss the effects of violence on a woman's well-being examine the role of the midwife in supporting women experiencing partner violence and highlight some of the practice recommendations for us as midwives. Domestic violence knows no boundaries against women. It affects women regardless of their culture and of their social status. As well as it being a, great, a gross violation of a woman's human rights, it is a global health problem. And I think this statement from the United Nations Secretary General actually sums up the, the problem nicely. And he says there's no one, that there is one universal truth applicable to all countries, cultures, and communities. Violence against women is never acceptable, never excusable, and never fair, never tol tolerable. So because we have an international audience today, I wanted to really look at some of the global statistics just to put some context to the problem. So the WHO and 48 population studies has estimated that 10 to 69% of women will experience physical violence by an intimate partner. It's a serious cause of death and incapacity among women of reproductive age as cancer, a greater cause of ill health than traffic accidents and malaria combined. It is the 10th leading cause of death for women aged 15 to 44 years. And between 6 to 59% of women report that they're forced to have sexual intercourse by an intimate partner in their lifetime. But as well as it having health, health consequences, it also has an economic impact. And a conservative estimate puts the welfare cost of intimate partner violence up to be around $4.4 trillion. If we include violence against women and children, then that cost rises to $8 trillion. And if we just look at Australia itself, it's estimated that the cost to the Australian economy is 9.9 .9 billion a year. And if, if that will continue to rise if we don't start to do some system responses to the actual problem. And while we don't know enough about interpartner violence, there are two things that are very certain. First, domestic violence against women and children will impose a huge social cost, as we've highlighted there. And secondly, and most importantly, there are solutions that can help to tackle some of these problems that, were very, that are very cost effective. And that's why reducing domestic violence belongs on the short list of the world's next set of development goals. So what are the associated risks for intimate partner violence? Well, they include being a female, having three or more children, 
being aged between 16 and 24 years if you're a woman or 16 to 19 years if you're a man. If you suffer from a long-term illness or a disability, including men a mental health issue such as depression or post-traumatic stress disorder. If you live in poverty, if you have a luck I'm really sorry, I don't know why my slides just keep jumping about. <laughs> they seem to keep moving. I'm really sorry about this. I don't understand why this is happening. Um, and um, there is an increased risk if the woman is pregnant or has recently um, given birth. And when a woman has more than one risk factor, it actually increases her risk factors of experiencing domestic violence even more. Hazel, I'm not really sure what's happened, but all my slides have just disappeared off the screen. Sorry, I'm just putting them back on again. Okay, so they're back up. So I don't understand why they keep disappearing. Yep. Sorry, everybody. That's all right. Um, yeah, Kelly, I can see that people can do that. I'm just figuring out how that how that gets stopped. We'll keep going um, and go on to the slide okay. that you're on at the moment. If um, if anyone can access them at the bottom of the arrows, just try not to. Just try and let um, Kathleen go through them at her own speed. <laughs> thank, thank you, everybody. The wonders of technology. So as I was saying, that um, if a woman has one or more risk, the more risk factors a woman has, the more more of an increased risk she has of actually experiencing domestic violence. And I think if we look at these statistics, look at some of these risk factors, they actually cover a large percentage of, of the women that we probably care for. So being female, obviously being aged 16 to 24 years of age and having three or more, or more children, often a lot of the women that we care for too may have a lack of social support and they may also live in poverty. And so when you put all those risk factors together, it's clear to see that some of the women that we're probably caring for are actually experiencing partner violence. So if we look at the prevalence of intimate partner violence in pregnancy, and um, you will find throughout this presentation that I use the terms uh, interchangeably, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, and that's because depending on what organization you're working for or what country you live in, um, you may find those, both of those terms are, are used or one term is used more, more than another. Academics and researchers will often use the term intimate partner violence, whereas women themselves and organisations that work with women will still use the terminology domestic violence. So what is the prevalence of uh, uh, intimate partner violence in pregnancy? I'm um, sorry, Hazel, the slide has just jumped back. I'm trying to get it to sync to everyone else. Um, so when I'm pressing sync to try okay. and get it so that you, only, you and I have got... Yeah, it's Deb here. Yeah, Deb? I think um, I'm going to reload um, these slides if you don't mind. I'm really sorry to interrupt you. And um, I think we really shouldn't press the sync button. So I'll reload them. And then if we don't touch the sync button, hopefully um, that will sort the problem. So can you bear with me for a moment? Yeah, sure, sure, Deb. So while we're waiting, we've got a question here from Susie um, about what about Aboriginality as a risk factor? Um, hi, Susie. Um, yes, definitely we do know that Aboriginal, uh, Aboriginality is a, a, a risk factor. Um, we estimate they're probably, as I said earlier, that um, domestic violence knows no boundaries, it, you know, regardless of social class or grouping. But we do know that there um, are, are certain groups of women that are at higher risk, and Aboriginal women are one of 
one of those risk groups. Uh, it's estimated they're four times at more risk of experiencing um, uh, violence during pregnancy. Has anyone got any other questions just while we're waiting for the presentation to continue? So there was a question, how do women react to being asked about um, domestic violence? Okay, well, um, I will come on to talk about that a little bit more, but we do know that um, women uh, don't mind being asked about domestic violence. We have the research and the evidence now um, that tells us that they don't mind being asked when it's asked by a, a knowing caring professional and there's no difference um, in those women who do who don't mind between women who are experiencing uh, violence and women who, who aren't um, they um, when we did our research we found that 98 percent of, of women um, did not mind being asked about uh, violence during pregnancy and and when we did the work with the women they actually said they understood why midwives would ask that question. Um, because of the increased risk. So, so women themselves have um, developed um, a, a good mechanism for actually expecting that question to, question to be asked. And, and teenagers are definitely at an increased risk of partner violence. We know that um, uh, when they're pregnant and, and when they're young, and especially when they're often with a much older um, partner, there is an increased risk of, of violence. Um, occurring. And we have no way of knowing on um, the other question, Kelly, that they have to be asked. Um, to be asked um, is not to be a victim is absolutely true. We, Because it affects all women in all various social groups and women often feel ashamed so they won't open up about this unless somebody asks them. And sometimes they may not be honest initially when you first ask them. Um, but, we, but we don't. We have no way of knowing which women might be in a violent relationship. So we have to go for universal inquiry because otherwise we could uh, be missing people. Um, so Hazel, as are my slides loaded back up? That, they I'm are. I'm just it, checking with it, Deb. Deb here. It looks like the PowerPoint might have been set up to go through an autoplay um, where they're changing every five minutes um, or five seconds on their oh, own. I, I think that might be the problem. Um, but do you want to just press oh, the play button and um, we'll, we'll see what happens. So what's happening is they're just going through. Is that right, Deb? Or should it stop? Um, if you just continue, <laughs> yes. If you if you if you continue and um, forward your own slides, and we'll just cross our fingers okay. and see if it goes smoothly. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Um, so just moving on quickly, because I'm aware that we would have lost some time now. Um, that we do know that women who experience um, partner violence uh, during pregnancy are a much higher of a risk of experiencing um, the risk factors, and those include repeated miscarriage. Uh, we often know that um, women um, that are physically abused um, will have a history of a uh, repeated miscarriage, spontaneous um, uh, abortion through through injuries that they've sustained. We do know there's a higher correlation um, with women who request terminations of pregnancy um, if they're in a violent relationship. They suffer from um, antepartum hemorrhage, uh, premature rupture of membranes, and premature labour, 
uh, also when they're in a violent relationship. Uh, because of the stress and the anxiety that goes on, um, women will often present with their intrauterine growth retardation. Abrupt placenta again, from in, any injuries that might be sustained from physical attacks. And stillbirth, um, we do know through confidential inquiries, intimate um, confidential inquiries, that um, mothers and babies have been murdered during pregnancy. Um, there is a high, much higher risk of a low birth weight infant. There is 16 times more higher risk of um, giving birth to a low, low birth weight infant. And um, some of the injuries to the unborn um, baby are fractures and ruptured uterus, uterus liver or spleen. So what role then, uh, how do we identify partner violence? How do we identify that, that um, uh, the women that we're caring for may be experiencing do domestic violence? And um, many healthcare professionals, including midwives, are not trained to identify um, domestic violence. Um, and they may mislabel and misdiagnose some of the women's problems due to anxiety or some other um, issue, often leading to inappropriate plans or ineffective remedies. But we also know that currently there's an ongoing debate about the commitment and the effectiveness of screening. Um, and that's because we don't really have a lot of research that tells us about what are the long-term outcomes for screening for domestic violence. And so that's where the future work um, needs to be carried out. But we do know that in certain health settings, such as well wooing clinics, such as maternity, that asking women routinely about um, abuse is good practice. But it must be acknowledged here that for some of those people experiencing abuse, they may choose not to disclose when it's asked by a midwife or another healthcare professional in the, in the first instance. Or they may decide it's not the right time for them to dis disclose. So the last thing we want to be doing is actually to be pressurizing women to give more, more detail or forcing them to take a course of action. And I, this is where I think in midwifery care, why continuity of care is so important. Because often um, when a woman first meets a midwife, it's very difficult to disclose about some of those personal issues in a relationship. But as that relationship develops, then a woman will feel much more com comfortable and able to disclose. So what would be the role of the midwife? Is this a really complex, difficult thing that we're asking midwives to, to take on? Well, it's not because we are actually in a un unique position to to address some of these health and psychosocial needs of women who have experienced um, violence. But to be able to do that, it's really important that certain minimum requirements are, are met because we've got to be able to do that A, effectively and certainly safely. And we may be the first contact for that woman who's ever asked a, such a question, who's ever taken the time to really find out if she's experiencing um, violence. And I do think that pregnancy and childbirth is often a time of change for women. And we know from the statistics that for all women who experience, and experience um, domestic violence, 30% of those women will have experienced domestic violence for the very first time during pregnancy. So it could be that the first time you ask that woman, she may not be experiencing physical violence, but she may be experiencing some of the, the psychological violence that goes on. But it could be because of that relationship that there's already violence occurring in the psychological and emotional sense, it could lead in to physical violence. And she'll remember that you asked her that question. And as your relationship develops, hopefully she would be able to be honest and be able to open up, up to you. And for some women as well who are experiencing violence, that she, as a midwife, you may be her first contact with health services. So I think it's really important that we continue to build on this work and continue to build our knowledge. 
And it's really important that midwives are trained to be able to do this. And But it's also important that then you know what to do with, with a positive disclosure when you get a positive disclosure. So I'm going to come on and talk about some of those things now. For those of you who can access it, the World Health Organization, in recognizing that healthcare providers and, and particularly uh, health, healthcare providers who work closely with women such as midwives have a really important role to play, have produced an excellent document and, and a, a policy guideline. And so I've, I've put that up there for you so that you can go online and actually get, get this document. It's an excellent document and it will help you help you um, understand um, some of the issues um, in an in-depth way that I don't have time to talk about today. So why are, why are health healthcare professionals and midwives actually reluctant? Well, I think it is about that fear of opening Pandora's box. So if you ask the question and the woman tells you that, yes, she is in a violent relationship, I think a lot of midwives are really fearful of actually knowing what to do next. They're often fearful of causing offence. Some may even believe it's not the province of health services, even, even though we know that women who experience partner violence are three times, twice as likely to experience depression, twice as likely to um, abuse alcohol uh, and illegal substances. Um, so I think as health, we're actually dealing with a lot of the consequences. So I think it's important that we're, be seen, we're now seen to be proactive. And we're predominantly a female profession. And if we know that um, domestic violence affects one in four women, then um, it's possible that we ourselves may have experienced um, domestic violence at, at some point in our, in our life and may therefore find it very difficult to actually to go, go there with, with a woman. But there's some really safe practice guidelines that we need to think about if we're actually um, going to start asking uh, women. And that is, please only ask women when it's safe to do so. And therefore, knowing how to ask the question involves attending work, training workshops, um, practicing how to ask. But what's really important and what women want us to do is be very clear about what we're asking and be confident when we're asking the question. Because if we come across as asking the question in a shameful way, then women feel shame too. It's really important that we listen carefully and we respond constructively to a positive disclosure. We consider the woman safely safety and her children's safety and you consider our own safety it's really really important that you do not put yourself at risk if a, and, and being fearful of a positive disclosure i've heard midwife say to me so what do i do if a woman tells me yes that she's experiencing um, domestic violence there's three really three simple things that you can do reaffirm a positive disclosure so what i hear what you're telling me is and then it's really important to say to her, I'm sorry to hear that this is happening to you. How would you like me to help? Is there any information you need? There are support services that can help you. But it's also really important that you document if you've got a, a positive disclosure, but the document documentation has to happen in a safe way. And certainly in, in the UK, they have handheld notes. So you would never document a disclosure about partner violence in, in a woman's handheld notes because that would put her at more risk. But it's really important that you document somewhere. And I put on the slide there about um, some of the things that's really important to, to document. And people often say to me, well, how do I ask the question? What's the best way to ask the question? Well, I've already said that it's really important to be confident and to be very clear about your asking and what you're asking. But I really believe there's no script that fits all occasions. But just really focus on, on direct questioning. Um, and if your messages are unclear, the woman may, may misinterpret your message and the opportunity for her to disclose to you will actually be lost. Um, I absolutely believe confident questioning is the key. 
Um, and if you don't feel confident about what to ask or how to ask, then discuss it with more experienced colleagues who have, may have some good ideas and some suggestions about um, how, you, how you can ask the question. So I've already said responding to a positive disclosure just once again reaffirm what, what she's telling you, tell her that you're sorry that to hear that she's living with abuse. A really important thing to say as well is that you believe her because for many years she may have been living with a partner who will say, well, you know, even if you tell someone they'll never believe you. So it's really important to say, say that you believe her and thank her for being uh, courageous enough to, to tell you about the abuse. And then ask her what she would like you to do. Now, you will have some professional guidelines that you'll have to work with. But it's really important that she's involved in the decision making about what you're going to do. Where it becomes more complex is when this child protection issue is involved. And if you feel children at risk, then you have a very clear pathway about how you should deal, deal with them. But the woman should be... Um, involved in the decision making that, that um, you will make around her disclosure. Again, documenting a positive disclosure is really important. Um, and that, again, on this slide, um, it's just some of the things that you really need to think about um, when you're actually uh, documenting it. And safety assessment is really important. Is it safe for her to go home? And you will make that decision with her about her safety. But what we do know is that there's certainly some barriers for midwives when it, when it comes to ask, asking women about partner violence. And some of those barri barriers are a continued presence of a partner. A good practice is always, always to ask the woman when she's on her own. You would never ask in the presence of a partner. But I think in maternity services now, we've worked very hard to be very inclusive. And, that, and that's the right way for us to practice. But we do know then that sometimes it can be very difficult then to be able to actually get a woman on her own and be able to ask her this question. And so perhaps what we do need to think about is how, how do we manage that situation then? How do we get women to be on, on their own for a certain amount of time on her appointment or to have a one-to-one -one appointment with her? We also know there's some organi organisational barriers. So lack of privacy, we know that some midwives don't always have a very a private room, consultation room, and we know that midwives are very busy. And when we were listening to um, some of Ali's talk, we um, some of the comments were that, you know, how do you do all we have to do in such a short space of time? Um, I know from talking to midwives that they don't always have a clear referral pathways in place. So developing your guidelines and your policies and your referral pathways are absolutely essential before you would start to conduct any of this work. For women whose um, first language may not be um, English, then we know in countries like Australia and the UK, there's a lack of trans translation services and interpreter services. And we also know there's a lack of support for midwives to do this work. Um, all midwives should be trained and they should have ongoing support to do this work and we do know that that is not, not happening. Um, I think some of these, um, I'm just going to move on now because I know that we're running behind because of the slides. So um, what's the impact of research? Where are we now in this work in 2015? Well, we do know that women do not mind being asked about partner violence. So I think we, we know that we should be doing this work. We know that um, for all women who experience domestic violence, 30% um, of those who are in the very first instance of domestic violence will have occurred during pregnancy. We also know that if there's violence occurring in a relationship, it will escalate during pregnancy. We know now through research that when midwives are trained and given support to do this work, they do this work very, very well. And in the UK, NICE guidelines uh, have now been produced, again, reinforcing the importance of this work and how, as midwives, 
and um, healthcare professionals, we should be uh, responding effectively to, to this work. So the implications for practice are that mid as midwives, we must strive to develop an open, trusting relationship and create opportunities for women to talk about their experiences of violence. There has to be a sustained commitment to universal inquiry, but therefore midwives must become skilled in their communication so that women do not experience midwives asking them about a history of partner violence as nothing more than a tick box exercise. And we have to work up and find a way to offer women confidential time alone with a midwife. Um, we know this is happening in many areas, but we must continue to make sure that education about all aspects of domestic violence is implemented in all our undergraduate curriculum. Um, and that the form of this education should take a multi-agency approach. And the reason why I say that is because um, when women are experiencing domestic violence, we don't respond as a single agency. We respond as a multi-agency. So the approach that we do around the education should also be multi-agency. There needs to be a co continued commitment for education and, and training for all qualified healthcare professionals, including midwives. And the link should be made to other aspects of safeguarding, in, including child safety. It's really important that training programs of it are evaluated and that they should be skill-based and then evaluated for um, their efficacy. But we do need further research in this area. We need more quantitative and qualitative research exploring the dynamics of a trusting relationship between a woman and a midwife. I think as a midwife, we already ask women such personal, personal questions. And so, there, but there does seem to be some form of barrier around asking women about um, domestic violence during pregnancy for many, for many midwives. We need to continue to build on our research to develop a deeper understanding of violence against women and children. And um, presently, most of that research is focused on prevalence rates, detection rates, and the negative health consequences of um, interpartner violence. There's a gap in the evidence in respect to effective interventions. We need to know what works well. So we need to build on that body of work um, around what is the long-term outcomes of, of doing routine inquiry in uh, pregnancy by midwives. We need to know what difference does that make to women's lives and therefore we have to bring women's subjective accounts into the effectiveness of that referral pathway. Um, so to conclude, I think this is an excellent um, summary. We have some of the tools and the knowledge to make a difference. And those same tools have been, um, have been used successfully to tackle our health, other healthcare problems. Domestic violence, interpartner violence and abuse is often predictable and it's preventable. And therefore, we, we should be working very hard um, to try and respond effectively. And there's just some references. So um, thank you very much for listening. I'm so sorry that we had an issue with the slides. But um, I'd really I'd like to answer any questions that I can now. Thank you. Has anyone got any questions? Or you can put your hand up or you can type it in the, in the chat box. Thank you very much, Kathy. That was a very interesting and informative session. Sorry again about the, the slides. We'll just see if anyone's got any questions. Um, Ali, do you have any yep. Do you have any recommendations for places to have this education in Australia, i online or otherwise? Okay. Um, thank you, Ali. Well, <clears throat> um, here, here in Queensland and uh, the 
the Gold Coast were just about to start a, a training program for midwives. And part of that training uh, program will be obviously face-to-face -face, um, training, uh, sort of we're planning on a six-day six face-to-face training, but what we hope to do is actually put it uh, as an online tool as well. But the work we did in the UK, we found that the thing, the thing that midwives valued the most was actually the opportunity around skill development. So the opportunity to work in small groups and, and practice asking the question and, and, and having the opportunity to respond when um, someone in their group would, would give them a scenario that said they, they were in a violent relationship. And so when we evaluated the training that we had done, um, we had certainly changed attitudes, we had certainly increased knowledge and we'd certainly increased confidence. And, and um, but what the, the midwives valued the most was that opportunity for that face-to-face -face skill development. Um, but certainly the way forward is to develop an online resource. Okay, another question we've got here is, do you have any strategies for getting women alone when controlling men insist on being always present? Yes. Um, that, when I've spoken to midwives over the years, a lot of them have different strategies for um, getting the women on their own. And certainly the confidential inquiry into maternal death in the UK several years ago recommended that all women should be offered one appointment on their own with the midwife. But it is very difficult because we do know that controlling men are often the men who won't leave the women on their own. So some midwives had developed very clever techniques as in having the weighing scales in a different room. And certainly in our antenatal clinic, the, the, we used to ask the women to do a urine specimen um, at the clinic and we would have blue dots in the toilets and ask women to put a blue dot on their urine pot if they wanted to speak to a midwife um, about domestic violence. So that, that worked quite, quite well. We had quite a few women who put a blue dot on the sticker and then the midwife would find a reason to go and visit that woman at home when hopefully her partner was, was out. So, but some, there's no easy way. There's, you know, I, I think it, it is complex and it is difficult. And I think that's why this, we're still talking about this work instead of just getting on and doing it because it is complex and it is difficult. Um, and so I noticed that some people are saying that they take the women off to the toilet uh, and ask her then. And I think that's a really good idea. But then I've spoken to some midwives who say that they feel that's a hurried question. They don't feel they get the opportunity to ask it properly. And certainly when I was a practicing midwife and doing this work many, many years ago, I would, if a couple came together for the booking appointment, I would say to the part the partner that at the end of the appointment, I would like some time alone with them on their own. Uh, both of them on their own. So I would have the woman on her own for a few minutes and then I'd have him on his own and I would say, you know, how are you feeling about being a new dad? You might not want to say something. Is there anything you want to talk to me about or say that you might not have wanted to say in front of your partner? And so it didn't look as if I was purposely just getting her on her own. So you will, midwives have to find their own way of trying to do this, do this effectively. And it has to feel comfortable and it has to feel right for you, just like there's no one script on how to ask, ask the question because it has to feel right for you. But certainly during the training, we, we offer lots of different scenarios and different ways of asking that question. Excellent. Thank you, Kathleen. I think that, that um, having the partners on their own it, um, seems to be resonating well with a few people here in the chat room. As, as a good idea and, and I liked how you um, suggested in the training that you would do some scenarios where the midwife actually gets a yes because there might be some midwives that have never experienced what to do when the woman says says yes she has got yeah. an issue so I think that's a great a great um, yeah. thing to do too. And, and the other thing we noticed Hazel after the training there was that midwives would say that they were very, became very um, good at picking up the, because they have the knowledge and the education around it, they've become very good at picking up some of the signs that they maybe 
they said now, you know, we might, may have missed those previously. So they would then definitely try and think of a way to get that woman on her own to ask her because some of the signs were there that were alarming them. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Any other questions from anyone? So in what areas, Kathleen, could you see further research? Like what, what areas do you think are particularly important to get further research into um, um, domestic violence? Um, well, I think, you know, um, as I said, I, I think it's really important that we start to collect the evidence around for women who do, who do disclose and that we're able to offer them some support and help. What are the long-term benefits for, for them? Um, and women's accounts, uh, we do lots of research, um, but we don't include women in those. And I know my, my own PhD was talking to women who had experienced violence during pregnancy. And they often said that um, even if a midwife asked and she didn't, the, the woman didn't disclose at that particular time, the fact that the woman, the fact that the midwife asked made them feel that they could tell her if the, if, if the time was right. Uh, and because women do feel very ashamed and they said please don't stop asking us because we would never tell you otherwise because it, we how do we bring that conversation up because we feel so ashamed so the long-term outcomes for me is re really important and that we collect the evidence that by asking the question certainly in the UK by asking the question we had a sevenfold increase in disclosure rate from women so we know it's effective, but that was only a small pocket of research. So for me, I'd like to see a much bigger study done to uh, record the uh, disclosure rates if we start to ask this question. Excellent. And there's a comment here from Sarah um, that she's pleased to see that um, to see it starting to appear in textbooks for undergrad midwifery students. Um, mm -hmm. which is that's great yeah absolutely and um, and certainly uh, I think it's also appearing on the undergraduate curriculum um, people that I talk to um, other academics are certainly saying that they're including it in their in their program and um, what's not effective is if you just do an hour or two hours and certainly two, a two-hour training session it, it makes some difference but it, it needs to be longer than that for it to be effective and it's really important to have support mechanisms in place for for midwives when they're doing this work because it can be complex and it can be difficult. Yeah, thank you. All right, any other questions coming up? Well, I would, yeah, that's right, there's a comment there about having a trusting relationship mm. with the midwife before they disclose information, which I guess with our increased um, contingency of care programs around, um, yeah. certainly, you know, that, I mean, that could be quite interesting, looking at the effects of the contingency of care relationship um, and disclosing. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's so, so important, and that's why sometimes when you initially ask the question, you may not get a positive disclosure, but certainly as a community midwife in the UK, I found that as the woman and I um, grew our relationship, then um, I often would get a disclosure um, when I'd been told no the first time I asked. Yeah. And then would you, would you then be asking the same questions or would it just be coming up in conversation? Um, well, it would just um, come up in conversation, but we do, we do know now that um, certainly that the people are saying that we shouldn't just ask that question once, we should um, ask it um, at least two, maybe three times during, the, during uh, pregnancy. Um, so, but quite often, certainly many, many years ago, I would ask that question and then the woman would say, uh, you remember when we first met and you asked me about domestic violence? And I say, and she said, and I said, no, well, I just want to tell you now that, 
yes, it is happening. Because again, because we know that if it's happening um, prior to pregnancy, that it will often escalate in pregnancy. So, um, yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, thank you again for your presentation and thank you for everyone's questions and chats. I'm just going to turn off the recording now.